Welcome into the Neutral Zone presented by Q30 Sports. We have everything Quinnipiac hockey that you could imagine. Jonathan Banks with you, and we've got a great show today starting. Got Steve Pappas to my left. He watched both games this weekend, but we can do even better than that. Is Greg Cameron from College Hockey News. He covers Arizona State. He'll be with us later on in the first block. First, we'll get to Steve, and then we'll get to Mike Dalton a little later, who's got the women's hockey side of it. Steve, you watched the team this weekend. The power play, it isn't clicking. There are no more Chase Prisky in his office. Clap bomb after clap bomb getting those goals. What have you seen from them so far this you year? You know, it's four for 36 is the number that kind of that stands out. That's 11% the power play. I mean, you look in a, in a six month time difference how different this power play has become. And uh, it's been a lot of opportunities and, and, and just missing chances. I mean, there's, there's points where there's just no finish in the game. Um, and it, no matter how good your setup and everything else is and how, how well you get open, if you can't finish, and right now they cannot, then really it, it, it's hard to, to even get up to a 15%, let alone you know, where they were last year in the 20s and 25%. But uh, I think it's just going to come down to just stay at it, stay with it. I mean, Ren Pecknell's been doing this for 26 years. I think he knows what he's doing when it comes to, to, being, to running a power play. Yes, this team is young. So there is that, that little learning curve, especially special teams. It's, it's the, the most skilled part of this game, being able to, to really stay in sync on the five on four. So I don't think there's an issue down the road. I just think right now it's ironing out the kinks. And, iron, and ironing out the issue. What do you think is the number one thing that Quinnipiac's got to do on the power play? We're going to get to the youth and, ex, and, and inexperience in a little bit. But who needs to step up for Quinnipiac on this power play? Because last year there were just so many guys that could get the job done. Yeah, I don't think it's going to take one person to step up, per se. I mean, we've talked about I mean, Odin Tufto. We talked to him yesterday. He said, we might think he's nervous or, or, or he's rattled that he hasn't scored a goal, but he's not. He's the same calm, cool, and collective guy that he is. So I, I think it's a, as a whole unit, everybody's just got to uh, stick with the process, stick with the, 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 the culture and the identity of the power play. Uh, and be able to run it like like it's been run for the last couple years. So, uh, like I said, I don't think it's one specific person that needs to step up. I think it's just as a group entirely, you kind of need to, to iron out everything. We're talking about not being able to score. Now let's talk about stopping the pucks. Keith Petrarelli is in net this year, and it's something that we kind of talk about. Is there a goalie controversy? Is there not? We, we, we talk about it every year. Keith Petrarelli is the man in net, but how would you evaluate his performance thus far this year? Uh, it's kind of tough because, I mean, he's, he's had a very big workload to start this season. He's played in every single game, all seven games to this point, it's, which is really weird to see. I mean, we've had a couple times in the last couple years we've seen, you know, Andrew Shortridge and Keith Petrozelli splitting those non-conference games. And Evan Fear has played in, in, in a non-conference game. He played for 20 minutes. But it's been mostly Keith Petrozelli. And there's been some good and there's been a decent amount of bad for Petrozelli. I mean, his, goal, his goals against and save percentage aren't egregious. But there's just times where he gives up the big rebound. And we've, we've kind of harped on this a lot that his post-to-post -post movement is, is very slow. And for, for uh, a guy that came in as such a highly touted recruit and ha such a highly touted draft pick, um, we kind of expected maybe put a little too much expectations on him to this point. So maybe this is what he is as a goaltender. But to this point, I think there could be a goalie controversy. Evan Fear, he came in in the preseason, looked really well in that one game. I'm, I want to see him play a full 60 minutes because we've only been able to see him play 20 minutes at a time. So uh, full 60 minutes, and then I can give you a, a, an actual prediction of, of if there could be a goalie controversy because it's really hard to see have, have Petrozelli play seven games and, and in that time frame, Evan Fear play 20 minutes. I think Petrozelli is the guy. He will be the guy. But with ECAC hockey play on the horizon, it'll be interesting to see if Evan Fear gets a shout and gets a start in net. We talked about the goalies, and we're waiting to see if Keith Petrielli can kind of acclimate or ascend to the level of a third-round draft pick. He's still developing. We know that. Let's get to the players who still need time to develop. That's the youth and inexperience in this team. I believe Ren Pecknold said it was the youngest or maybe one of the youngest teams he's had in Division I. How much does that young factor play into the start of the season so far? Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about just last weekend specifically, going in and dropping both of those games to a team that you know they're better than, they're, they're a deeper team than they are, uh, it, it, it's a learning experience for not only the freshmen this year, but 
the sophomores from last year that really didn't have to go through that hardship until the end of the season where they didn't really have a lot of time to learn from it because it was right back into to the postseason. So I think this could be a really good experience for them, just being able to kind of learn from this experience and say, hey, we went out there, we kind of you know took Arizona for granted. We took the, the atmosphere of Arizona uh, and the heat, the warmth and everything like that, the sun. We haven't seen a lot of sun around here, so it's a nice, <laughs> change, it's a nice change of pace. So maybe they took that opportunity for granted, and, and it's something that – it's better to learn in a, in a non-conference regular season game seven games into the season than it is in March. So I think this experience of this last weekend could be very good. It depends, it depends on how they respond to it. It could either be really good for them in, in a learning experience or it could, I mean, it could shoot down the morale being that saying, hey, we just went out and we lost to, to twice to a team that we're better than. Yeah, when I talked to Nick Jermaine this summer, he outlined that was one of his key things is becoming captain, that people develop in different different levels and in different ways. He immediately talked about how Andrew Shortridge and other players in, uh, took time to develop and really acclimate to the Division One level. So we'll see what comes of that. Steve Pappas, thank you. But now we're going to get to Greg Cameron. He was at the games this weekend. He covers Arizona State for College Hockey News. Greg, let's hear what you got for us. What was your main takeaway from Quinnipiac's performance in person when you look at Friday and Saturday? Uh, well, one of the things that Coach Pecknell brought up before the game was the youth of the team, 22 freshmen and sophomores, and it showed uh, as the game went on on Friday, and it definitely showed coming out of the room uh, for the whole 60 minutes on Saturday. And they, they're very talented players. I uh, liked what I saw from guys like Skylar Brindamore, guys like Gus Van Ness, uh, but it, it's still a work in progress. It's early in the season. They're going to make mistakes, and a lot of that had to do with how the goals went in. A lot of blown coverages in the defensive zone in front of the net and on the weak side. Uh, just something that they can shore up as they go forward here and conference play starts soon. It's interesting you bring that up because last year when you talked about Quinnipiac, you would say that their strong point was their decor with Prisky, Rafferty, Carlos Kuksta, and players like that. Obviously, they've all kind of left for the AHL, NHL, as it may be, but now it's kind of the offense that needs to pick it up. And you talked about the decor. Would you say that's the biggest weakness of Quinnipiac's team right now? I would say so as of right now, yeah. And like we mentioned with the uh, with the upperclassmen, it's only Kuksta left yeah uh that's an upperclassman he got the start both nights uh he was one of the more relied upon guys throughout the weekend uh i i expected a lot more from peter deliberatory uh was a little bit disappointed in his performance obviously he provides a boost on the power play which is one aspect they'll need to clean up here as the as the season goes on but uh the, the pairings were mixed up a lot. Coach Pecknell uh, didn't put a lot of stake into keeping guys together too much. And he tried to get a lot of different looks out of the guys uh, on defense. And it, it just wouldn't work when all was said and done. They were still getting uh, out-hustled out by Arizona State. Uh, it's something that it, it, it's, it's hard to play in that arena, right, given how on top of you all those people are, given how small it feels. Uh, but... But it's something that they're going to need to improve uh, going forward. I think that I think that they'll be fine. Uh, to be honest, as as time goes on here, as they get their feet wet more. Uh, but it, it's it's certainly the point that uh, that that they'll need to improve upon the most. And with Arizona State, when I talked to Nick Germain before the season, he circled Arizona State. He said Arizona State and UMass are two of the out-of-conference games that he's looking forward to most. And how could you not when it's Arizona State, a rematch of the NCAA tournament, and UMass, obviously, who made it all the way to the national championship game. But from an Arizona State perspective, did you feel as if, did you get the sense there was a chip on their shoulder from how last year ended with the best year in program history? Absolutely. They talked about that at length uh, throughout the week. We got we got to hear from Brinson Pashnuk, the captain, uh, and he, he he missed no words saying that that was scheduled uh, that was circled on the schedule for them as well. Uh, it was it was uh, it was something that I wanted to see them uh, come out and have that fire. They typically uh, start games a little bit slower than they have this uh, this past weekend. And uh, they certainly reversed that trend, uh, given the given the team that they were uh, playing across from. Greg, thank you for joining us. I was talking to you over Twitter since the Midwest Regional Final last year. It's really nice you made the time to come on and talk some hockey with us. Coming up after the break, we have Mike Dalton to break down the women's hockey team. They've got two good matchups coming up this weekend. Stay tuned. 
Back from break, and now we've got some women's hockey to talk about here alongside beat reporter Mike Dalton. Mike has been around this team for years, so he knows way more than I do, so we're going to dive right into it. All right, John. Well, um, truth hurts, speed kills. And that's exactly what happened with the Bobcats this past week. They went 0-3 in their first ECAC hockey games of the season, losing to Princeton, Cornell, and Colgate, respectively. And that was the first thing uh, Cass Turner brought up when I asked, what has been the biggest difference between conference and non-conference play? And she said speed. And, you know, in these conference games, plays where the Bobcats may not have gotten burnt or taken advantage of, they were taken advantage of in ECAC hockey. And that's the difference. Exactly. And Cornell, they really pointed out, is a very fast-paced team. Colgate, also a team that plays a lot on momentum. And that really showed because the Bobcats actually led Colgate 2 to nothing heading into the second period. And Colgate scores four unanswered, so it's just been a, a tough week for the Bobcats. Hopefully they look to bounce back this weekend, though. I think it's a good point because in any level of hockey, it's really speed of play and how fast you make decisions and can solve problems yourself is a big thing. But talking about solving problems, mm -hmm. Dartmouth and Harvard this weekend, they both have some key players to keep an eye on. For Dartmouth, who, are, who does Quinnipiac need to stop in order to win? Well, I'm actually going to go with someone a little unusual. It's number 22, Catherine Trevers. In her four games that she's played this season, she scored twice and she has two assists. She's tied for the team lead in points, and she's only a freshman, and she's a freshman forward. Uh, similar to Sadie Peart and Kenzie Hosworth, she's just found early success finding the back of the net. And this is a player that the Bobcats really don't have a lot of film on, if any. And so it's tough to play against someone you don't really have a, a lot of knowledge about. And I think that she could certainly take advantage of it. I think Trevor's could have a very good weekend if um, she is able to find the back of the net. For Harvard, I have Allie Pepper, a defenseman. Uh, she hasn't scored any goals, but she leads the team in assists with five. And in the three games she has played, She's a plus eight rating. Have you ever heard someone with a plus eight rating through three it's games? It's pretty rare. It is. Uh, so, you know, not bad for someone that's played three games. And with a team, like I said, with a, a young offensive core, Sadie Peart, Kenzie Hosworth, as I previously mentioned, uh, she'll be out on the ice a lot, especially since she has that experience. And she will certainly be able to use it to shut down those first year forwards. And that could be a problem for the Bobcats. And we have a defenseman that can instigate attack out of nothing and stretch passes or just playing through the lines. That's something that's really dangerous for Quinnipiac to take to keep in mind when they're playing Harvard. Definitely. And I mean, this is a team that when they forecheck with all five of their players out on the ice, they are a very lethal team. And we've certainly seen that so far. I mean, I think I could say a good portion of the goals that the Bobcats have scored when I've been able to see them play have been when defensemen are coming up on the forecheck. Caster and even once mentioned uh, either during Maine or the Providence series that Kenzie Prater noticed that the team was going through a line change, hopped right in on the forecheck, went down low in Gretzky's office, turns the puck over, Taylor House comes right in, scores. So this is a team when they are forechecking on all levels, they can win. And you've outlined that they can win if they forecheck at all levels. So now we're going to transition to the weekend predictions. Yep. Do you think Quinnipiac can win this weekend? This is honestly a very important weekend for the Bobcats. They're one of just four teams in ECAC hockey that has yet to win a division game. So this, I, I think they need to walk away with at least a win, probably two, because these are two very beatable teams, in my opinion. I think Dartmouth... They can certainly beat. They're predicted to be on the lower end of the preseason um, standings before you know play even started. And Harvard is going. I think is going to be a little bit tougher. But the Bobcats have had a lot of luck against them ever since they lost to the Crimson on March 14th, 2015. They have not lost to them since. And I think that they will definitely be able to carry in that momentum. So this senior class has never lost to the Crimson before. They just don't know how to lose. They're allergic to them. <laughs> allergic so, to it. Yeah, they are. They are allergic to losing to Harvard. And I think that if they can if they can hold both teams to three goals or less, I think they'll do fine. Cool. Mike, thanks for joining us. Those are your thoughts. It's an Ivy League weekend this weekend. Dartmouth and Harvard for both the men's and women's hockey team. You'll want to keep it at Q30TV.com to follow all that and also Q30 Sports on Twitter. For Jonathan Manks, Mike Dalton, Steve Pappas, and our guest Greg Cameron, thanks for joining us. We'll be back next Wednesday with more thoughts, reactions, and instant analysis from Quinnipiac Hockey.